Welcome everyone, Fruits of the Orchard, Parshat Toldot. This Parsha is really the one Parsha in the whole Torah where the main figure is Yitzchak and Rivka. Avram and Sarah had three full Parshas and a little bit of a fourth. And starting next week till the end of the book of Genesis, Yaakov and Rachel and Leah will be the main figures, Yosef. But of the three patriarchs, it will be Yaakov will be the central figure. So only one Parsha in the Torah really uh, focuses on Yitzchak Avinu. So this is our chance to learn about Yitzhak Avinu. So we'll start with, in this Parsha, there's, uh, I believe, four different articles. The last article is about how the name Yitzchak, the four letters of Yitzchak, Yud, Sadi, Chet, Kuf, that each one of these is the, the first letter is one of the ways that we refer to Eretz Yisrael, as we're going to see. And the reason that uh, this would even uh, come up is that there is a, in this week's parasha, there is a famine in the land of Israel, just like there was a famine at the time of Avraham. Avraham and Sarah go down to Egypt because of the famine. Later, Yaakov leaves Eretz Yisrael for two reasons. One is his brother Asaph wants to kill him due to the end of this Parsha where Yaakov, we'll call it engineers, getting the blessing that Yitzchak had at least initially had thought to give it to Asaph. Afterwards, when he gave it to Yaakov, he confirmed that he came to understand that he was the right person to receive it. But he also left Israel. So when there was a famine in this week's Parsha, so Yitzchak, in a sense, was prepared to leave. But God came to him and said, don't leave the land. Stay in the land. This is the land that I will give to you and your children. So in Parshat Lech Lecha, four different times, God promises the land of Israel to Avram and all of his descendants. In this week's Parsha, this promise is reconfirmed, and this time it's given to Yitzchak. Later, Yaakov will also get the same promise. But since Yitzhak was the only one not to leave Eretz Yisrael, because later Yaakov leaves for a second time with his whole family and goes down to Egypt. So there's something unique about the connection between Yitzhak and the land of Israel. So the four letters of Yitzhak's name, as we're going to show right now, are four different ways that we refer to Eretz Yisrael. So the first letter is Yud, and of course it's Eretz Yisrael. So it should be mentioned that in the five letters of the name Yisrael is the first letter of all of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. They're all included in the name Yisrael. The Yud is Yitzchak and Yaakov. The Shin is Sarah. The Resh is Rachel and Rivka. The Aleph is Abraham. And the Lamed is Leah. So all the patriarchs and matriarchs have their first letters in the name Yisrael. So we refer to the land of Israel. Today it's the state of Israel, Medinat Yisrael. 
So that's the Yud of Yitzhak's name. The Tzadi is sometimes the land of Israel is referred to as Eretz Svi, the land of the deer. Why is that? There's a number of reasons. One is <coughs> that Eretz Israel, if you look at a map or a globe, you, you can hardly see it. <laughs> it's like so minuscule on the map. <coughs> and yet, everything is contained here. The whole world, like right now, there are Jews. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> are Jews from over 120 countries here. Little Eretz Yisrael has snow-capped mountains, has deserts, has, uh, has sea, has snow, has burning heat, has the, the lowest point on earth, the Dead Sea, has the largest natural crater in the world at Mitzpah Ramon, has world famous coral reefs, dolphins, everything is contained in little Eretz Israel. So what does it have to do with the deer? They say that, that and you can see it on a deer, the skin of a deer is incredibly taut. There's not, you can't see like a, a, an ounce of fat on a deer. Is the skin is so tight and if you would um, skin a deer, they say you could never get the skin back on. And so this represents that, that Eretz Yisrael is taut. It's small, it's condensed. And yet, we say in the future, the land of Israel will spread to all the other lands in the world. So that's one reason is called Eretz Tzvi. Also, the Tzvi is a very quick animal. In fact, the, the post office of Israel has a picture of a deer on it. This is the blessing that Naphtali gets. Naphtali is called like a swift deer. And so this represents Israel as is a happening place. Like things in time are always happening here. It's a very dynamic place. Everything is moving swiftly like, like, like a deer. And the third reason is that the numerical value, the gematria of Tzvi is 102, which equals emuna, faith. And that's the song for those who were here when we played the song, or before, Lule Hamanti, if I didn't have faith that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So Eretz Yisrael is a land of faith. That we, we know that even, even though the newspapers make it seem differently, but every day that we're in Eretz Israel and we exist here is on the level of miracle. Because if, if you look at a map, hopefully it's changing now that we have the Abraham Accords and hopefully other Arab and Muslim countries will follow. But we're surrounded by uh, from Morocco to Indonesia, <laughs> we're, we're like surrounded. So it's a land of faith, Eretz Svi. The third letter of Yitzchak is a chet, and that is the, the verses I just said, Eretz Chaim. Israel is called the land of the living. And that is very, very connected to last week's Parsha. And we, we touched on this last week where it says, Shnei 
Chaye Sara, the years of Sarah's life. And Shnei also means two. The two lives of Sarah. What are the two lives? Life in this world and life in the world to come. And so Israel, that's why there's this, this custom uh, to try to get buried in the land of Israel. Because one is that we're told that when the resurrection of the dead happens after Mashiach comes, People want to be in Israel already. Don't want to like have to take a, 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 an underground passage to, to get here. So it's the land of the living. And of course, like I said, with Eretz Zvi, it, it, the land is alive. The people are alive. It's a dynamic society. And it always has been and it always, always will be. The last one is last letter of Yitzhak's name is Kuf. And that is connected to Eretz HaKodesh, the Holy Land. In English, this is probably the, the, the most famous reference to Eretz Israel is the Holy Land, Eretz Kodesh. So these are the four letters of Yitzhak's name. And as I said, it's very significant that God said, don't leave the land, stay in the land. And he's unique in that sense because Avram left, Yaakov left, the 12 tribes left. Only Yitzhak remained in the land. Rivka comes from outside of the land. So, one other thing about Yitzchak, the four letters of Yitzchak, is that we're told that the numerical values of the four letters of Yitzchak are also significant. The Yud of Yitzchak, Yud equals 10. And these re are represented by the 10 tests of Avraham. The 10th test is Akedah Yitzchak, is the offering or the binding of Yitzchak. So he's involved in the 10th of the tests. The Tzadi, Tzadi equals 90. That's the age of Sarah when she gave birth to Yitzchak. The Chet equals eight. That is, Yitzchak is the first Jew to be circumcised on the eighth day. Avraham was given the mitzvah, but he was already 99 years old. And, and Ishmael was 13 at the time. Yitzchak is the first one to fulfill the, the, the mitzvah of circumcision on the eighth day. That's the chet. And the kuf equals 100. He, that's how old Avraham was when Yitzchak was born. So that's a, a beautiful understanding of, of who Yitzhak is according to the, the, the gematrias of the letters of his name. Okay, so now we go to the beginning of the Parsha. And this is the first uh, article in the Fruits of the Orchard for this Parsha. And there, I'm not gonna go into this too much, but there there's a beautiful hint that in uh, our Shabbat prayers and holiday prayers, right before we say Borachu, there is a, a section where the name of Yitzchak, the four like, stanzas, and the first letter of, of uh, the um, second word, it spells out Yitzchak. And those who have the book, you, you'll be able to see it clearly. I will open it here quickly. And the, the third word, the third letter in the third word, hopefully everyone can see this. This is how the, the prayer lines up. And here we see uh, 
in this column, the first letter of each word spells out Yitzchak. So you see it right here, Yud, Sadi, Chet, Kuf. And the third letter is Rivka, Resh, Bet, Kuf, He. So this is just a hint to what it says that it's in the 25th chapter, the 21st verse, 2521. So it says, So it says, Yitzchak prayed. We're going to see that the word vayetar is the language of prayer. And Rashi even says it's like intense prayer. It's uh, praying over and over again, that kind of uh, idea. And Yitzchak prays to Hashem. Here the word nochach could mean for the sake of his wife who at that point was, was barren. Or nochach also means across from. So Rashi points out, a beautiful Rashi is, here it says that Yitzchak prayed for his wife or across from his wife. So Yitzchak, so Rashi brings the tradition that Yitzchak stood in one corner of the room and Rivka was across from him on the other side of the room, they were praying together that they should have a child. And then the, the verse continues, ye ater lo Hashem. And in the art scroll, they translate it, and God allowed himself to be entreated. Now you'll notice that the word for prayer for Yitzchak is the article, instead of prayer, says entreated. Yitzchak entreated God. And here it's the same word. And God allowed himself to be entreated. And Rivka, became, his wife, became pregnant. So here we see that this is a, a, a deep connection between Yitzchak and Rivka to prayer. And we already saw this last week because it says, that Yitzchak went out to converse in the fields towards the evening. And we, we learned that that is language of prayer and meditation. Converse is is how we can understand Rabbi Nachman's idea of heat bodedut, the idea of going out into the fields, into nature, and conversing, literally conversing with God, and opening one's heart, and, and talking to God in formal prayer. We have formal prayer, but this is informal prayer, opening one's heart, and just speaking to God as if he's like right there, which of course he is. We're not always aware of that. So we see that in last week's Parsha, there's a very, very strong connection between Yitzchak and prayer and meditation. And here, Rashi says, it, it wasn't that they just davened one time, that Yitzchak was, was praying all the time. Yitzhak and Rivka were praying all the time to have a child. So here we see this, this connection with Yitzhak and prayer. Now, the Slonim Rebbe in Nativa Shalom says uh, uh, an amazing thing. He brings a Zohar. And the Zohar says that this word... Um, by um, you could read it differently because the ayin and the chet come from the same place in the mouth and they can be exchanged. 
So the Zohar says, don't read it be, be tar, read it ve, ve, ve yech, yech tar. Yech tar means, choter means to dig, especially like a tunnel, dig a channel. And so the Zohar says that the, the, the idea, just like Sarah, was physically unable to have children. Rivka also was unable to have children biologically. So in other words, in a sense, regular prayer is not going to do it. We need a miracle here. And of course, Sarah giving birth at the age of 90, and we're told that she actually didn't even have a womb. And it was the same thing with Rivka. She was much younger. And so it says that, that in the book of Shmuel, it says, God promises that no one will be left behind. Lo yidach mi menu yidach. No one will be left behind. So we learn from this that, that every prayer counts. Every prayer is heard. We might not get the answer that we want. But in this case, like regular prayer was not going to work. So Yitzchak is davening for a miracle. And in a sense, he's tunneling a, a new channel to God. And therefore, when the sentence says about God, God allowed himself to be entreated, means that according to nature, God couldn't answer according to nature. God, in a sense, had to make a miracle, which is represented with God tunneling a new uh, energy that would allow Rivka to give birth. So this is all based on, on the Zohar, reading it. Don't read it, he prayed or he entreated. Read it, he tunneled. Now this is very connected to a statement in the book of Esther. When Mordechai sends Esther the news that Haman wants to destroy all of the people, and he says, you have to do something. And she said, I, I can't do anything. The king has not called me. And you, you can't just go into the king's court unannounced. And so Mordechai says, if, if you don't do this, salvation will come will come from a, another place. And maybe you and your family will be destroyed. And who knows if for this very moment, you didn't rise to become the queen. So the question is, what does he mean that salvation will come from another place? What other place? And so this is very similar to what we're saying here. And again, I'm quoting the, the Slonimer Rebbe in the Tiva Shalom who says that, that God has a way that he runs the world according to nature. In other words, God set up the laws of nature and the world runs according to nature. It runs according to mida connected mida. But there are times when, <clears throat> in a sense, miracles are called for. According to nature, salvation won't come. It has to come from another place. And this other place is like God channeling a, a different energy that will, will, will transcend the natural laws of nature and allow a prayer to be answered or salvation to come. So this is a very, very deep understanding. And then to even make it deeper is 
Reb Shlomo brings a, a Torah from the Robchitzer Rebbe. The Robchitzer Rebbe was one of the main students of the Seer of Lublin, very, very famous Hasidic Rebbe, the Robchitzer. And he explained like this. He explained that since the word entreated or prayed is repeated, first it says Yitzchak prayed, and then it says God allowed the prayer to be answered, or Yitzchak entreated God, and God allowed himself to be entreated. But the, the, the Ropchitzer, it's, it's almost more literal, even though it's, it's like a drusha, it's almost more literal. He says that Yitzchak prayed and Rivka prayed, but according, uh, but according to nature, it, it, it just wasn't going to happen. So Reb Shlomo brings an example, and it's something probably we, we could all understand. He said sometimes, especially with our, our, our children, sometimes our child or our friend, it could be our parents, want something, and either they ask us for a favor, or we see that this is something that they really want and really need. And so we take it so much to heart that it turns out that we want it even more than they want it. <laughs> In other words, because of our connection, our love for this person, we personalize their want to the point that, in a sense, we take it over. So here the Ropchitzer says an amazing thing. He says, here Yitzchak is praying, Yitzchak and Rivka are praying to have children. And of course, Hashem wants and needs Yitzchak and Rivka to have a child in order to continue the Jewish people. And so because of God's love for Yitzchak and Rivka and the Jewish people, he, as it were, began to pray that Yitzhak and Rivka would have a child. And because God is praying for them, of course, it's going to happen. <laughs> so, like I said, this is almost a more literal understanding of the words than how we were explaining it in the beginning. But it's a very deep Torah here. And like I said, I think this is something we can understand where, where, where sometimes someone we love wants or needs something and it touches us so deeply that we really begin praying for them in an even more intense way than they're praying for themselves. Okay, so now, since this is the Parsha of Yitzchak, one of the main parts of the Parsha, and this is not dealt with so much in Fruits of the Orchard, but as always, I'm trying to add to that which is not mentioned in Fruits of the Orchard. One of the main incidences in this Parsha where we see the personality the strength, the attributes of Yitzchak is the whole matter of his redigging the wells that Avraham had dug and that the Philistines had uh, stuffed up. So here we see Yitzchak's Gevura. We always talk about Avraham is Chesed and Yitzchak is Gevura. And of course, we see Gevura that, he, that Yitzhak allows himself to be bound to the altar. And of course, that took tremendous Gevura, strength, might. But here we see it, in a sense, just as much where he is willing to confront the, the Philistines and he redigs the wells and he doesn't give up. The first two wells. The, it caused great uh, strife. 
but he didn't give up. And then he dug a third well, and that one he called Rehovot, the name of this, a city in Israel to this day. Rehovah means wide, Rachav, because there they didn't challenge him. So he named it Rehovot because now his, in a sense, his stake in Eretz Yisrael is not being contested. Now, what do these wells represent? So, like I just said, in a simple meaning, it, it means possession of the land, control of the land. On a deeper level, what does it mean that the police team stuffed up the wells that Avram dug? So spiritually, what it means is that the wells that Avram dug, we, we say anytime water is mentioned in the Torah, ain mayim el Torah, it's always a reference to Torah. And so the wells that Avram dug, these, this is his whole philosophy. This is his whole worldview. This is what he's trying to teach the world is represented in the waters that he revealed in these wells. And he was using to uh, give people to drink. Just, it represents the Torah that he was giving people so they could grow. And, and so after Avram dies, the police team stuffed them up. So Yitzchak redigging the wells, this is in a sense his not only statement, but this is his taking upon himself to be the second of the patriarchs. Here, this is where he's taking it upon himself to carry on the traditions that he learned from Avram, the teachings. And one of the explanations, the, the, again, from the Tivot Shalom, I had a chance to learn today in preparation for the class, so that's why I'm quoting him so much, is that until then, Yitzhak was a very solitary person. He was a, a more of a meditative person, a, a, a prayerful person. He didn't go out like Avraham to teach the whole world. And yet here, it's his redigging the wells. Well, part of that is to give water to, uh, to the thirsty. That's why in, in Isaiah, it says, all who are thirsty, go to the water. Well, that's like, isn't that obvious? Why did, why did a, a great prophet of Israel have to say, if you're thirsty, go drink something? <laughs> so what it means, though, is if you're spiritually thirsty, go to the Torah. Ain mayim el Torah. There's no water referred to other than Torah. If you're thirsty, go to the Torah. So Yitzhak, in a sense, comes out of his shell, and he's also now starting to teach people the idea of one God and turning people on to this idea. Now, there's another important idea that we can learn from this. And that is, there's a combination here of, about these wells. Some of the wells that he's digging, he's re-digging the same wells that Avram dug. Other times he's digging new wells. Sometimes he is naming the wells the same as his father, in particular Beersheba, and the other wells, he's naming himself. So here we see a combination of Yitzhak carrying on the traditions of Abraham, but we also see him striking out on his own. And we know that everything in the Torah is, it, it is archetypal. These are not one-time stories. You could say, why do we know that? Yitz why do we have to know that Yitzhak dug wells? You could say, what's the big, what's the big deal? 
of course you have to dig wells, especially in Eretz Yisrael, when you, when you don't have a lot of major rivers here. But here we're, 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 we're understanding this in the spiritual sense and paving the way for all of us. In other words, what we can learn from this, and this is so important, and it's, it's critical to a, a healthy understanding of our connection to Torah and Judaism, that it's, it's critical, crucial to be connected to our traditions. And here we're learning the stories of our forefathers and our, our actually it's our three fathers and our four mothers, our patriarchs and our matriarchs. And it's, it's both a privilege and a responsibility to carry on the tradition. On the other hand, every person has to find their niche, their face in the Torah. That's why we say, Shivim Panim the Torah, there's 70 faces of the Torah. And the Arizal said, there's 600,000 faces in the Torah, one for each root soul in Israel. Every person has to have their chiddush, their, their, their new understanding of certain mitzvot, traditions, customs within the tradition. So Reb Shlomo took this idea and he called it traveling on the highways and the byways. He said, the highway, this is our tradition. We need, we need to stay on the highway. The byways, this is, are the little called shortcuts. This is the very, our, our special little corners that are connected to the main highway. It's like, you know, you're taking uh, one, like Highway 70 in America and the rest stops along the way. Right, so it's like you take the highway, ah, but then you get off and you, you take a little teol and you find something beautiful or new. So this is the combination of tradition and newness. And this is a, also a Torah from Reb Shlomo. Back, if you remember when after Avraham uh, frees Lot and the people of Sodom, and he comes back to, to, to Israel, and Malti Tzedek comes and greets him. He was the, call it the high priest of Shalem, Yerushalayim. It was called Shalem then. And he offered him bread and wine. So this is another Torah from Reb Shlomo. He said, what's the difference between bread and wine? He said, bread, the fresher it is, the better it is. Stale bread doesn't really make it. What is wine? The older it gets, the more age it gets, the better it gets. So he said, this is a great secret of our connection to our tradition and Torah is we have to know when to connect deeply to the wine of Torah, meaning the, the older our tradition is, the deeper it gets, the richer the, the wine. But we also have, have to know how to bake a fresh bed. We have to know how to put our flavor, our perspective, our special uh, nuance in everything that we do. So these are all hinted to in the wells that Yitzchak is digging. Okay, now we're going to go to the first verse of the Parsha, which is, 
chapter 25, verse 19, the very first verse, the Eila toldot Yitzchak ben Avram, Avram holid et Yitzchak. These are the generations of Yitzchak, the son of Avraham. Avraham gave birth to Yitzchak. So everyone asks, there are no redundancies in the Torah. When you hear this in Hebrew and even the way it translates in English, it's like, we know if, if it's Yitzchak ben Avraham, then we know that Avraham gave birth to Yitzchak. Why do we have to have that second statement? So this is a question everyone asks. And the answer that's brought in Kabbalah and Hasidut is that this is what's called the secret of inter-inclusion. In Hebrew, hit kalalut, from the word kol. Everything is interconnected. In, everything can be connected together. So what is the inter-inclusion here? So we, we learn, and, and it's brought down, it happened at the Akedah, that the, the main attribute of Avram is chesed, and the main attribute of Yitzhak is gevura. But what happened at the Akedah was each one, the, the whole incident was so like beyond normative logic that Avram had to transcend his natural inclination of chesed how in the world is he going to fulfill God's seeming command to, to sacrifice his son? It's like it, it would run against any of our, our sensibilities, especially Avram. But he had to take upon himself gavura. And that's why when the angel come, came and said, don't do it, now I see that you have Yira of God. Yira is connected to Gevura. In fact, the, the numerical Yira means fear or awe. This word Yira has the exact same gematria as Gevura. It is the inner dimension of Gevura. So, so Avram had to take upon himself Gevura. Yitzchak had the gevura to allow himself to be uh, bound on the altar, but he had to take upon himself chesed in order to fulfill his father's command and God's command. So this is the inter-inclusion that takes place. Now I want to mention here, and we, we don't have time to go into it, but uh, some of them you could actually see on YouTube. And some of you may be aware for around three years, Rav Ginsburg gave a monthly class in English in Jerusalem that was broadcast around the world. I had the great uh, privilege of being the MC for these classes. And my favorite, he, in three years, he covered a lot of different subjects, but there was a, a period for almost a year where once a month he would take a personality in the Torah and he'd create what's called a partsuf, a uh, a partsuv literally means a face, but it means a, a structure. And what he would do, and I, I'm only bringing this up because here we're talking about Avram is known as chesed, but Avram also had gevura. He, he went into the fiery furnace of Nimrod for his beliefs. Well, that takes a lot of uh, strength. He fought... A, a war to redeem his nephew. That takes strength. He, his whole life actually, he, he broke his father's idols. 
he had tremendous strength. And we're going to see that Yitzchak, where else do we see the chesed of Yitzchak? And that is at the end of this parsha, and in Fruits of the Orchard, there are two articles about Esav and Yaakov. And the last incident in, in, the, in the portion is Yitzchak calls Esav in in order to give him a blessing, thinking that perhaps he had reached the age where he had to prepare that maybe he could leave this world at any time. And there is the whole story how Rivka urged Yaakov to dress up like Esav and to go and to take, receive the blessing. So the question is, we would have to dedicate an entire class to this incident. It is definitely one of the, the most enigmatic, deepest, profoundest, um, interesting <laughs> stories in the whole Torah. Like what happened here? What, what are all the motivations here? Who thought what? Why did everyone act the way they act? So that's not my purpose right now. But the question everyone asks is, why would Yitzchak want to give this incredible blessing to Esau and not to Yaakov? Everyone asks this question for literally thousands of years. What was Yitzchak thinking? So there are many, many ways to answer this, many. But I'm just focusing on this interinclusion of Gevura and Chesed. Because here we see Yitzchak was fully aware of who Esav was. He was fully aware that a lot of his actions were not very positive. But he also saw the tremendous potential in Esav. And Esav did have tremendous potential. And he, in a sense, Yaakov, he'll do fine. He'll be okay. But Yitzchak, because of his chesed, he didn't want to give up on Esav. He had tremendous chesed for Esav, and he didn't want to give up. Just like Avram had no problem reaching out to the whole pagan world and people who were doing things quite opposite of what he believed, but he had no problem reaching out and trying to <clears throat> draw them close. So Yitzhak also, when it says that he took upon himself the chesed of Avram, so he's doing this with his own son. He's not going to give up on Esau. And he's hoping that this blessing, this will, in a sense, knock some sense into Asa. He will, he will put him on the right, on the right road. So going back to this idea of building a part suf, so what Rav Ginsburg would do, and I'm really hoping that at some point soon, they'll come out with a book uh, in English, because these classes were given over in English. What he did is he took a personality, and here let's, let's talk about Yitzchak, and he would go through the Svirot, and he'd explain from the very stories, the very verses in the Torah, or the Midrashim, what was the Keter of Yitzchak? What was the chachma? What was the bina? What was the dat? What was the chesed? He would go through all of the svirot. And at the end, you have like this holistic picture of a, per of, of a personality instead of like a very one-dimensional. Avram is chesed, Yitzchak is gevura, and that's what it is. No, we know that in each of the svirot are all 10 svirot. So some of them you can find on YouTube, I believe, where he goes to 
different personalities and creates this partsuf of all the different spheroid. It's very fascinating and it's an incredible way to learn. It's an incredible way to learn. Okay, now we go back to Yaakov and Esav. One of the articles in Fruits of the Orchard is about the reincarnations of Yaakov and Esav. As we know, all of the personalities in the Torah are archetypal, but that includes even those personalities that we don't relate to is, is like on the side of good. Aesop is also a archetypal energy. So is Pharaoh. So is Bilam. All of these represent energies that are ever existent in reality and really within each person. And so Yaakov and Aesop. So these are not their only reincarnations, but two of them are, Yaakov is reincarnated. I'm gonna say at least part of Yaakov, because that is the, 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 the big teaching of the Arizal, that when we say Yaakov is reincarnated in Mordechai, it doesn't mean that all of Mordechai is only the reincarnation of Yaakov. Every person is a composite of different personalities and different sparks, soul sparks, and different reincarnations. So part of the soul of Mordechai and the whole story of Mordechai, Esther, and Haman is Yaakov. And who is Haman? A reincarnation of Asav. Now, what's the connection here? So, in a couple of portions, at the end of this parsha, so after Yitzchak has given the blessing to Yaakov, he comes to realize that is really what God wanted. And he gives Asav a blessing as well. But he doesn't take away the blessing he gave to Yaakov because he realized that was the, the will of God. He calls Yaakov in and he confers upon him the blessing of Avram. He makes him the third of the patriarchs right on the spot. And he sends him away because Asa wants to kill him now. And also that it's time for him to get married. Yaakov leaves, for, according to tradition, for 34 years. He has the tribes, he's, except for Binyamin. He's coming back to Israel. And in Pasha Vayishlach, he's going to have to face Esav again. This is where the famous wrestling match happens between Yaakov and the Torah says a man. Rashi says it's the angel of Esav. He's also fighting with himself. He's also contending with God. We'll get to that Parsha. But he defeats the, this energy, the man, the angel. <clears throat> and the next day he physically greets Asaph and he bows seven times to Asaph. And <clears throat> in a sense, it was like, Call it derech eretz, good manners. It was to placate Esav. It was a sign of peace. But the sages actually, and I've said this before, the, the, the sages spare no one. <laughs> no one is spared <laughs> from the, the rebuke of the sages. They said Yaakov should not have bowed down. He, he, he won the battle against him. Why does he have to bow now? And so in a sense, they criticize him now. And obviously the Chazal held Yaakov in the greatest of esteem. This is Yaakov Avinu. So their criticisms are, we'll call them 
quite minor. So I'm mentioning this because the story of Mordechai and Haman, which is the story of Yaakov and Esau, this time Mordechai will not bow down to Esau. And this is part of his, his fixing. That part of Mordechai, which is Yaakov, gets fixed by not bowing down to Haman, not bowing down to Esau here. And then <clears throat> there's one other series of reincarnations where they come back. And that is in Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, in English, Judah the Prince. This is the person who compiled and redacted the Mishnah, one of the most important accomplishments in all of Jewish history. He compiled the Mishnah and he wrote it down, what was until then a completely oral tradition. He wrote the Mishnah down so that it would not be forgotten. This was after the destruction of the Second Temple, after the failure of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, after most of the Jews of Israel were now in exile already. The community in Israel was terribly weakened. And Yehuda Nasi felt that if, if the tradition wasn't written down, it could get lost. So he did that. And he's considered part of his soul is Yaakov Avinu. So who is Esav? So Esav is reincarnated in the soul of Antininus. Antininus was the, the, the emperor of Rome, or, 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 or perhaps a, a better, maybe he was the governor of, of, of Israel at that time. The truth is, I'm not sure if he was the emperor or the governor. But there are many, many stories in the Gomorrah. They actually were very close friends. They had tremendous respect for each other, even, even though their worldviews were very different. Antoninus was, was not Jewish, and he, he, he wasn't following Jewish customs, but he, he loved Yehuda Nasi. And Yehuda Nasi loved Antoninus. And in the Gomorrah, it's recorded many of their discussions, many stories about them. And here we see a tikkun, a rectification. Esav, and this is how we're going to end the class. Esav and Yaakov, not only are they brothers, they're twins. They're in the womb at the same time. And we know that Esav is he's called Edom. And from Edom comes Christianity. And even before Christianity comes the Roman Empire, which came and destroyed the Second Temple and took us into exile and slavery. And so Yaakov and Esav have a thousands of years of what we'll call a love-hate relationship. A very, very troubled relationship. And yet, our tradition holds out that eventually they will come to a state of peace. In the Messianic era, just like uh, Yitzchak and Yishmael will make peace, so will Yaakov and Asa. And in fact, in last week's Parsha, when Avram passes away, so it says that Yitzchak and Yishmael came together to bury Avraham. And Rashi over there says that Yishmael is the older. So why isn't he mentioned first? So here we see that Yitzchak is mentioned first, and Rashi brings a tradition that Yishmael did tshuva. And they actually came together. And it was Yitzchak who, according to Rashi, brought Hagar, who is now called Keturah, to remarry Avram. 
It's Yitzchak who made peace with Yishmael and Hagar and had a reconciliation with Avram. And so we're told also that when Yitzchak is buried, Yaakov and Esav come together to bury him. So this is a, a, a sign for the future. This is prophetic that despite a very troubled relationship between Esav and Yaakov, but even in two parshas, when they finally meet, so uh, it says that Esav kissed Yaakov. And over the letters of the word, and he kissed him, are dots. Anytime there are dots over a word, it means there, there's, there's a tradition uh, that, that is hiding here. So Rashi brings a statement by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said in the Gemara, halacha hi. It's a halacha. It's like a state of fact. It's a reality. Esav sone et Yaakov. Esav hates Yaakov. It's just, it's just, that's what it is. But Rabbi Shema Bar Yochai says, so what are the dots doing here on this word? He said, even though it's like a law that Esav hates Yaakov, in this particular case, he didn't. They act, he actually kissed him, and they made peace. After all the years, you can imagine, Esau is like, for 34 years, is like, if I ever see him again, I'm going to kill him. But when he finally sees him, he, he changes in such his very nature. And he embraced Yaakov. That's a sign for the future. May we live and see it when Yitzchak and Yishmael come together, when Esav and Yaakov come together. Bezrat Hashem, we're getting closer. We are getting closer. And we can see in reality the Abraham Accords, it's, it, it's telling us something. There is something happening that is hopefully, obviously, we still have too many enemies, too many enemies, but there's a movement here. And we know that in the last 40, 50 years, there's also been a reconciliation between the church and the Jewish people. And that also needs some improving, but it's, it's like between darkness and light, the change over the last uh, 2,000 years. So may we see true peace in the world.